blood that Jesus shed for me way, way back. Genesis 1 and 1, it is obvious that God had 
already finished creation. And then because it starts off with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when we get to verse 2, it says the earth was without form and void. Well, it's very obvious that something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Listen to it again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we see creation. We go down to verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. We know that in between those two verses, there was the Luciferian rebellion. But the thing about the awesome God that we serve, he just started all over again. Because when you read Genesis 1, after it says the earth was without form and void, God commanded the light to come forth. And then he began the whole creation cycle all over again. That's the God that we serve. We're talking about his demolition power, his ability to build it, and his ability to tear it down. Most of you will remember King Nebuchadnezzar. Did he learn that lesson? He had been exalted over all the kingdoms during his day. But because of his rebellion, God allowed him to come down. He was put out in a pasture with other animals for seven years. And when he repented at the end of those seven years, God restored him. I want to also remind you concerning God's demolition power, concerning the Tower of Babel. Do you remember that? Some say the Tower of Babel. Either way, the babbling that was going on when the languages were confused. And if you remember, God came down and saw what man was doing under the directions of Nimrod. You remember him? He thought he was some great one. God brought it down. We're dealing with God's demolition power tonight. Then, if you remember, out in the wilderness, most Moses was out there with those chosen people of God, the Jewish people, the chosen people, but they became a stiff neck and a rebellious people. And God was so upset and he told Moses, he said that he would allow pestilence to take each one of them out. And he said, Moses, I will start over with you. That's the God that we serve. Again, all power, all creative power. But we're focusing in on the demolition power of the Holy Ghost. God, again, can build it up and he can also tear it down. And I want to focus in on some of that tonight because some have been taught only about this wonderful God and his amazing grace. And they do not know that he's also a God of judgment. I will be reminding you even now concerning the priesthood of Eli. We're dealing with God demolition power. You remember he continued to not correct those rebellious sons that were serving with him as priests. God had warned them and God God warned them, and then God brought all of them down. And one day, all three of them died, along with the daughter-in-law. Oh, my God. You see, he is a God with demolition power. He will warn. He tells us that he will warn us. Warning comes before destruction. So tonight's teaching is a warning by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is a warning for us, the body of Christ. Then I want to mention to you Ananias and Sapphira. You remember them in the New Testament. God does release selective judgment at times. You remember how they lied concerning some money that they had promised to give to the kingdom of God for the work of the church. You remember that? And then they decided that they would keep back what they had already vowed out of their mouth. See, we're going to focus in really on witchcraft and enchantment and how the devil operates and bounds us up through rebellion, through lies, through carnality. So, of course, we all remember the story. They stood there before Peter and they lied. And you remember what happened? They both fell dead. We're talking about selective judgment, that this was in the New Testament 
under the covenant of grace. And I want to mention to you, Elimus, when he withstood the operation of the kingdom of God when the apostle Paul was preaching. Do you remember that in the New Testament? Under the covenant of grace, Paul was preaching. People were being drawn into the kingdom of God, receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. And Elimus was there with the deputy of the city. And he was speaking in the deputy's ear interfering with the word that was coming from the mouth of the apostle Paul and trying to pervert the word, the teaching and draw that deputy away from that scene oh but I love it, it's in the book of Acts, the Bible says Paul locked eyes on him he focused on him and he called him the son of the devil. And if you remember, Paul spoke blindness upon him for a season. We're talking about selective judgment, and that is in the New Testament. And then also we will mention Simon. You remember him in the New Testament, under the covenant of grace, because I'm going to be dealing with witchcraft this month. As we know, uh, in a few days, Halloween, the high holiday of Satan, will be celebrated. People have already been kidnapped and prepared to be sacrificed by the kingdom of darkness. We need to be aware of these things so that we can pray and we can pray in advance. So I will be talking to you about Simon again during the days of the apostle Peter. If you remember, Simon heard uh, Philip preach and all of a sudden he became a believer. With this point, I'm bringing out the fact you can be a believer and still have a demonic stronghold inside of you. Simon is a perfect example of that. The Bible says in the book of Acts, he heard Philip preaching. He became a believer also, the scripture said, using the word also. And then later, the apostles came down and they began to lay hands on the ones that had asked Jesus to come into their hearts. And the people began to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in their heavenly language. So many have been taught that that went out the window years ago. Let me tell you, you'd better seek God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need the power of the Holy Ghost enabled, enabled to, or in order to enable us to stand during these times. So when Simon saw the people were receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongue, when the apostles laid hands on those people, he wanted in on it. You see, he was Simon the sorcerer. He had operated by bewitchment, by witchcraft. We're going to deal with some of that tonight. And you know what? Peter looked at him and said, your money perish with you. Your money came by this. See, we can't by. So many people think the dollar bill can buy favor with God. No, we have to obey with the dollar bill, but you can't buy favor with God with money. We simply have to surrender our hearts and obey Him. I want to show you just a portion of a quick video that I had already prepared dealing with God's demolition, uh, demolition power. Now this is a video dealing with demolition in the natural, but we're going to take it into the realm of the spirit. It is so interesting as I was watching this video. First, they would lay explosive in the buildings. You're going to hear the explosives going off. And then after those explosives go off, the building would come down. That is exactly what the word of God is. It is an explosive. And I tell you, those that are operating in darkness, this is a warning. The explosives are getting ready to go off by God's demolition team. Watch this. To the right. Watch to the right. Speaking on Holy Ghost demolition power tonight. 
God is getting ready to bring down, bring down some things that the enemy has erected in the land, erected in the kingdom of God, erected in the hearts of man. Again, we're dealing with God's demolition power. He'll build it, but he'll also bring it down. Just as I said earlier, ask King Nebuchadnezzar. God is not a God that we want to play with. He's a true God, a real God, and he wants us to walk in obedience. Now let me not finish this without showing you this quick video. The next little video shows that the same God that brought it down is the same God that can build it up. Watch this. You saw that building come right up out of the ashes. That's the God that we serve. He works with us. His spirit strives with us because he wants to protect us and perfect us. And he wants us to mature in the things of the Lord. He tells us in the New Testament, we have to come off the milk. So tonight is not a milk teaching. We're going to throw out some steaks, as my pastor used to say. I want to go to page one of my outline as I said, we are dealing with bewitchment, enchantment, and tonight's subject is tore up from the floor up. Those videos reveal that God will tear it up from the floor up if it's not right. And we have here who I mentioned earlier, the sorcerer, Elimus, and it says under the covenant of grace. I want to bring that out because a lot of times when you're talking about witchcraft and things of that nature, people always refer only back to the Old Testament. I want you to know the devil is still the devil even in the New Testament. So here here in the New Testament, Acts 13 and verse 8, it says, But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. I mentioned that earlier. The deputy that was there listened to the apostle Paul preach. Look at verse 9. And Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. I just want to pause and say, think about it. See, when you have the Holy Ghost power on the inside, he will lead you and let you see when the devil is trying to interfere concerning the work of God. Then we go down to verse 10, no, verse 9, I believe. Then saw, No, verse 10, verse 10. And it says, and said, this is what Paul said, full of all subjects who else was called subtle? Remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, that snake that slithered into the garden, he was called subtle above all the beasts of the field. So here Paul uses that term to refer to this sorcerer. When you're operating in the power of darkness, you're operating with the spirit of the devil on the inside of you, and he is subtle. So he said subtility and all mischief. He said, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Oh, my God. He picked up on it right away. A demonic spirit inside of that sorcerer interfering with the kingdom, the work of the kingdom of God, interfering with the gospel message that was going forward. And look what Paul said. We go down to verse 11. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he was led about, and he went about seeking someone to lead 
him by the hand. Oh my God. Paul spoke upon him, released upon him a curse of blindness in the New Testament. We're dealing with those operating with bewitchment, with enchantments, with sorcery, fortune tellers, and all of those people operating by the power of darkness. I want you to see the mindset of God because sometimes we're not taught the mindset of God. We hear name it and claim it, grab it and blab it. These are the things that a lot of times we hear. All the focus is on uh, prosperity. God is a God that will prosper us. Nobody can deny that. But he is a God that demands our obedience. So we see what happened here to this sorcerer. Now we go down on the outline and we look at Exodus 22 and 18 in the Old Testament. I want you to see what God thinks about operating in witchcraft and all this fortune telling and enchantment and palm reading and all that stuff that goes under that umbrella which is all dealing with witchcraft witches and warlock and listen to what he said Old Testament thou shalt not suffer a witch to live oh my God that's actually in the Bible and in the days of old they would have to put the witches and the warlocks and those that worked in enchantments those that work with familiar spirits, those that worked in necromancy, calling forth the dead, which were just actually demon spirits trying to represent your deceased loved one. But all of those, God said, put them to death. Now, how do we do it now? In the New Testament, no. We release the Word of God, and the Word of God can bind up and drive out that spirit that's operating in that individual, praying that the individual will obey and take heed. But the Lord put a death sentence up on witchcraft. We see it right there. We're still in the Old Testament. We look at Deuteronomy 18 and 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that you this divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. We see that word again. There was an idol God back in the days of old that the people, God's chosen people began to worship. See when you get mixed into the world and hang around the carnality in the world, uh, the, the spirit that is upon the world can seduce you and you will start participating in the same things that the world participates in. Oh my God, let me just throw this to the side like these uh, Hollywood housewives. That same spirit has crept over into the church. The word diva. I just like, I, I, the other day I had to just shake my head. Uh, one minister referring to the other minister as a diva. Do you know what a diva is? We reach into the world and we grab all this mess and we clothe ourselves in it. Oh my God. But tonight God is releasing the hammer of the word of God. Again, Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. You've been building up your kingdom and your lies, your deception all over the land, your entrapments. But Satan, we're going to tear your kingdom down. So we see again right here at Deuteronomy 18 where the Lord speaks to us concerning all of these practices, enchantment, witchcraft, all these things that fall under the umbrella of Satan. Now we go down to 1 Samuel 15 and 23. I love this scripture because this is going to tell you another way that witchcraft operates and certainly in the body of Christ. Listen to this. It says, For rebellion is as witchcraft is as the sin of witchcraft when we rebel so many rebel listen to the next part of it i love this and it says and stubbornness oh my god is that spirit of stubbornness up on many many that are called in leadership i'll do it my way we better do it God's way if we're going to be accepted by him. We learned that lesson in the very beginning of the Bible with Cain and Abel. Cain thought he would
would do it his way and offer up any type of sacrifice to the Lord. And you know what happened? God said, ain't accepting that. We have to follow the dictates, the plans, the instruction, the mandates of the Most High God. So again, let me start at the beginning. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And we know what iniquity is. Inher inherited weaknesses. Weakness, I mean, uh, iniquity is sin, but it is a sin that strengthens itself down through the generation. Great, great, great grandpa um, was was an alcoholic and, and a womanizer. So then that, that iniquity comes down the family tree and then there's the, uh, the next generation, the, the son and then the grandson. It goes all the way down and it strengthens itself. Just like the spirit of homosexuality and lesbianism. In a lot of families, that spirit has crept in and you will see it strengthen it itself. It will come down sometimes it'll skip a generation but that spirit will go after someone in that generation and they the demons get in and get in through doors that are open sometimes through things that that person has experienced. Uh, I remember listening to a lady. I don't know why I'm touching over on homosexuality and stuff again. I dealt with that last week. But I interviewed a, a lady once, and uh, she told how she uh, had entered into uh, a lesbian relationship as, as a young woman. And as a result of that, she enjoyed what she uh, had experienced, and she began to live a lesbian lifestyle. So See, when we trespass and we transgress, we give the devil a legal right to come and enter in and dwell in camp. Uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? A squat on our territory. Drive it out. So anyway, we see again concerning rebellion and concern and stubbornness. Each one of us have to check ourselves and say, do I have a spirit of rebellion? Am I rebelling against the things of God? Am I stubborn and stiff-necked and nobody can tell me nothing? If you are, I tell you what, you're in trouble because that's exactly how Nebuchadnezzar was. At the bottom of the page, the spirit of bewitchment. And here we're going to deal with Simon versus Paul. I mentioned that at the beginning, but I want you to see it yourself. Let me see. Where is page two? Right here. We're pulling it up, and this is Simon. It says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Listen to this. Given out that himself was some great one. So he had earned a reputation for himself, but it was through bewitchment, just like witch doctors that I know of. People go there every time something is wrong, they'll, they'll run to the local witch doctor instead of running to Jesus. Oh my God. And then they fall prey to their enchantments. They are enticed and they become locked up and bound up under the power of darkness. We go to Acts 18 and verse 11. This is still dealing with Simon. And it says, And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. I'm going to give you the meaning of the word sorceries in just a moment. But we continue on because he's going to encounter Peter and Peter does not play. play. And then Simon himself believed also. I mentioned that earlier. He was listening to Philip preach and he believed also. He believed in Jesus. But again, this proves you can believe and still have a demonic stronghold. And it says and when he was baptized. Listen to that he got baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So he began to see all of that. This sorcerer, this man that had operated by the power of darkness, he saw all of that. He was baptized. He asked Jesus to come into his heart. But let's go down to verse 18. You see we're skipping from verse 13 to verse 18. And when Simon saw that through land on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. 
Oh my God. He wanted to buy with money. There are people right now that think they can buy God with a George Washington or whatever else is listed on our paper money or with the debit card. Oh my goodness. What deception. The devil has deceived you. Or they think they'll go and give a huge offering into uh, the treasury at the house of the Lord. Put a huge offering and they can buy favor to continue on in their midst. No, God wants us to rend our hearts and not our garments. We have to obey. We have to come out of stubbornness. We have to come out of iniquity, generational weaknesses and curses because daddy and mama did it that way. Oh my God. We have to get a relationship with God for ourselves. I don't care. If husband goes the wrong way, wife goes the wrong way, grandma and grandpa go the own, uh, their own way, we have to stand in the presence of the Lord, each one of us for ourselves. Oh my God. And will we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So here he was and he thought he would buy. And you know Peter. Peter didn't bite his tongue. Look at Acts 8 and verse 21. He says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. He says, for thou heart is not right in the sight of God. And did I skip one? Let me go on. Let me read verse 20. This is what Peter said. But Peter said unto him, thou money huh, perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Peter let him know right away. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, your money does not move, does not operate concerning this kingdom. Oh, my God, concerning the power of the kingdom. We have to be vessels that get in the presence of the Lord and seek God. Let him mold and make us. I told you I would share the meaning of the word uh, bewitch. Listen to it right here. It refers to that there are two uh, terms for the word uh, bewitched, uh, two definitions. It's all under the same um, umbrella, but I just want to break it down that this refers to the two men that we just talked about, Simon as well as Elimus. And it says here the word bewitch means to throw out of position, displace. And that's exactly what bewitchment, the power of bewitchment does. It throws us out of place. It, it displaces us, throws us out of position. Instead of us being aligned with the kingdom of God, the word of God, the directions of God, following God, the statutes of God, we are displaced and we are now listening to a foreign voice. A bewitchment, again, look at the top. It means to throw out of position to displace. It also means to amaze, astonish, throw into wonderment. You know, those operating in witchcraft, they can work demonic miracles. I watched last night a video from South Africa. Somebody uh, filmed it with their cell phone and I watched as this person on the video had had uh, astral projected and was in the air and turning and, and performing all type of tricks and other stuff that they had on that. All under the power of Satan. Yes, he can do enchantments. He can do demonic miracles. Oh my God, but we have to serve God and come out from the power and the enchantment of all of that. Then we go down still dealing with the word bewitch. It means to be amazed. It means astounded. Look at number C. To be out of one's mind. Oh my God. Beside oneself. Insane. And we've seen a lot of that uh, like zombies. You know some of us laugh, laughed at the zombie movies. But that is true. Under the power of the devil. People are controlled like zombies. That's why Jesus came to set the captives free. He included that phrase in his very first sermon in the New Testament. And number D, it means to throw one out of his mind. Oh my God. Drive one out of 
his senses. And of course, we've seen that. You, you've seen people bewitched. Uh, if not, as my mom used to say, just keep hanging around. Oh, my God. We go down on the bottom of the page, the word sorceries. And sorcery means magic, magic, art, and of course, the word sorcery. We're going to go now to Galatians 3, and we're going to show you a scripture where the word uh, bewitched is used, and then we'll show you the meaning of that uh, bewitched. So here at the top of the page, Paul said, O foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth. He says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth. So Paul was dealing with them uh, in this particular um, teaching or uh, this particular story in the book of Acts. They had began, uh, they'd come out from under the law. There are those that are still trying to live by the law. But Jesus brought forth and instituted faith that we walk by faith. We're not bound up under the law. So he was telling them somebody has bewitched you. You started out in faith. Now you're going back under the law. That's another teaching. Don't have time. But here we look at the meaning of the word bewitched in this particular sentence. And uh, oh well, this is another scripture and I'll show you the meaning in a minute. It's No, this is the meaning. I'm sorry. Bewitched in this particular scripture above. It says to speak ill of one, to slander are traduced. Now listen to the meaning. That was a new word for me that traduced. To slander him or traduce him. Listen to this. It says speak badly of or tell lies about someone so as to damage their reputation. Oh my God. Paul refers to that in the scripture to the Galatians as bewitchment. And does that not go on in the body of Christ? To release lies against somebody, to slander somebody as to ruin their reputation. He says that is bewitchment. I just want to say Selah. Pause and think about it. And then it means to charm and it means to bewitch. I think I referred to the charms in my last teaching. People that are into all of this, put the rabbit foot in your pocket. I'll never forget what, I think it was Pastor John Osteen. He was my pastor for a while and I love what he said. He said if the rabbit foot carries so much power, why did the rabbit lose all of his feet? <laughs> Only Pastor John could come up with something like that. That is so true. But yet mankind, we, the chosen people of God, believe we have to run around with a rabbit's foot on our keychain or in our pocket to bring us luck. You don't have to operate under luck. Jesus died on the cross so we can operate under his blessings. Glory to God. Then we go down on the outline. I want to tell a t personal testimony where it says reference to people from Louisiana. Oh, goodness. And their belief system. I did, uh, I shared with you, I think last week, about the 20 years of hospital ministry and 12 years of prison ministry, but also did four years going to four separate private uh, care facilities in our city. I did a Bible study at four of them for four years. And uh, one of the uh, caregivers at one of the facilities she was going through some some problems and so forth and anyway she would be uh, at my Bible study so she called me and I need you to pray for this and this and this so I agreed with her on the phone and I prayed for her and God did what we agreed on because the Bible said if any two on earth agree as asking anything it shall be done so we agreed together we prayed and God moved for her well then within the next like 48 hours I got a phone call and uh, the person introduced themselves and I'm related to so and so which was the lady that I had just prayed with she was from Louisiana the first lady and I'm I'm in Louisiana also and I need you to pray with me over such and such so I prayed thinking nothing nothing of it and then uh, the uh, at the end of the prayer how much money do I owe you I'm thinking what 
You don't owe any money. We serve the same God. We, we can uh, come to him, the power of agreement in prayer, and he will move on our behalf. Do you know I got two more phone calls from relatives to that relative, two more, because God moved in number one and number two, the third one, will you pray with me? And at the end of that prayer, how much do I owe you? And I begin to realize some people have the mindset because they have operated under those that are operating in witchcraft and beguiling them and enchanting them that they have a mindset a belief system that they have to go to someone and pay for God to move on their behalf just like when I mentioned the purgatory the other week but anyway I won't go into that again oh my God you have been bewitched if that is your mindset. The Lord tells us that if we ask, we shall receive. Seek, you'll find. Knock, and the door shall be open unto you. We don't have to operate through Satan's tricks, oh my God, of the trade. As we look here at Isaiah 47 and 9, but these two things shall come to thee in a moment. This is a curse being released. In one, uh, in one day, the lost of children and the widowhood. And I want to just bring, let me just go on and read it all. They shall come up on thee uh, in their uh, perfection uh, for the multitude of thy sorceries. And you see that? You see the word sorceries highlighted in, in yellow? A curse is released where children would be lost and widowhood, a, a husband or a wife would be lost because of the multitude of your sorceries and for the great abundance of of thine enchantments. So here is a curse release. This is the prophet Isaiah releasing the curse by the directions of the Lord. Now and I, I want to be sure that I explain this is a specific curse release for a specific reason because of enchantment, because of sorcery. When we dabble into that mess, we release a curse upon ourselves. There's a scripture that says, he that breaketh through a hedge a serpent will bite. We can't play in the realm of the spirit. Now I want to throw in, if you've lost a child or you've lost a husband or a loved one to death, I am not saying that you are operating in witchcraft or bewitchment and that's why that loved one, no. We're living in a fallen world where there's a real devil in operation. But here specifically, I just want to bring out a curse is associated with witchcraft and sorcery. Now we go down to Proverbs 26 and 21. Oh, I love this one. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, both of those are birds, so the curse, causeless, shall not come. Now let me read it in the NLT. This is a promise to us. It says, like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, both of those are ver birds. Look at the underlying part. An undeserved curse will not land on its intended victim. Isn't that awesome? An undeserved curse. But the opposite of that is there are deserved curses. We have to all, uh, walk upright. We can't play on this battlefield. Then we go to Proverbs uh, 26 and 3. It said, oh, I just love this. This is so funny. Talking about the back of a fool. It says, guide a horse with a whip. A donkey with a bridle and a fool with a rod to his back. Oh my God. A fool has to be guided with a rod to his back. We don't have to be fools. Glory to God. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Athens, and I believe I'm on the final page of this teaching for tonight, and we are going to pray here in Acts 17 and verse 16. Paul is going to minister and he says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, uh, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw 
the city wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly or entirely given to idolatry. Oh, my God. You know, you will notice that uh, in regions and cities that you visit, people just believing in the power of darkness. Said the whole city here was given to idolatry. But I'm just going to point out on the highlighted parts how Paul dealt with it. Therefore, disputing he in the synagogues with the Jews. So Paul went forth teaching, tearing down that demonic teaching, that idolatrous belief system in their minds through the teaching of the word. We go down to verse 18. I wanted to show you the top line. Then certain philosophers. That's something else we have to watch out for in the body of Christ. Philosophers. People that have figured it out their own way and it's not based on the word of God. They will lead many people astray even as these philosophers did in Athens. And when you read that scripture out, they began to say Paul was putting forth some strange God as he was teaching about Jesus. I just want to encourage the ministers of the gospel, go on and preach it. Go on and preach the gospel in the midst of philosophers, in the midst of those that are operating in idolatry, because the gospel has the power to tear down. Glory to God. We're again talking about tore up from the floor up, the demolition power of God. We're on the last page of this outline, and it says, oh, I want to deal with this, out of the snake zone, reference snake lines. I don't know if you all have heard of this, so let me just read it. The snake line is an invisible line as one ascends a mountain above which snakes do not live because the atmospheric conditions are not conducive to their survival. And what this is teaching, let me read it all and I'll, I'll break it down. Uh, that means uh, below the line at a certain height, you will find snakes and battle with them. But above that line, snakes just do not live. Oh my goodness. So the snake line, it has been referred to by scientists and all, but when you go so far up the mountain and those snakes can't go uh, to, to certain heights because of the atmospheric chain, and uh, I want to take that principle in the natural and take it in the realm of the spirit. Oh my God. I want to remind you of Mount Zion, the city of the king. As we press forward and as we set our faith and set our um, set our forehead. I'm thinking about Jesus right now. How his forehead was he said it was set like flint. Flint is the hardest rock. In other words, he was focused on obeying Jehovah God. Focused on fulfilling his divine assignment. So he ascended. He ascended into the presence of the Lord. The Bible said we are seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. As we are seated there, we can sin above the snake line realizing the snakes are still there but realizing as we're seated in him we have power to tread on serpents on scorpions over all the work of the devil so I want to encourage you to press into his presence and ascend above the snake line see when you're down below the snake line those are the ones that are running to the witch doctors and the psychic readers and the palms readers trying to get rid of the snake no get into your place in him you're in inherited place. Glory to God. Be seated. Be seated in heavenly places. Set your affections on things above, not on things in this earth. Learn who you are in Christ Jesus, that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Glory to God. And then this last scripture on the outline for the night. This is so powerful. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that we henceforth walk not. You see that walk not underline? Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Oh my God, I tell you that is what's destroying so many. And that is exactly what King Solomon mentioned in the Old Testament. Vanity. 
vanity. All is vanity. I guess he knew after marrying all of those wives and all those 700 concubines, over a thousand women, then at the end he hollered, this vanity is all vain. And so it is for so many. They're going after the wrong things. Oh my God. We have to again seek his faith. Seek the presence of the Lord. Seek conversation with the Lord. Seek the instructions of the Lord. We're only here for a short time and then we're going to stand before him. Will we hear depart from me, you worker of iniquity, or will we hear well done, good and faithful servant. And then this very last scripture on the outline, verse 18. I love this. Having the understanding darkened. See, that's so many. Understanding has been darkened. Being alienated from the life of Christ, the life of God, through, listen to this, the ignorance that is in them. You know, we don't have to operate like that. Be alienated from the life that is in God, the life through Christ Jesus. We don't have to operate with a darkened understanding, but that's what you're going to have when you dabble in all of this garbage. Oh, my God. And he says, uh, the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We don't have to have blinded hearts tonight. Oh my God. We need to operate in the presence of the Lord. Be seated in his presence. I'm trying to go to another page where I can just pull that out the way and I will have the full screen again. But just want to encourage you. Again, we talked about tonight, tore up from the floor up. Is that you? Does that concern your family, your household, some situation on your job? I know it concerns our nation. Do you not know that we have sorcerers in top positions in our nation praying, oh my God, praying that uh, an evil agenda prevail? So I want to encourage the prayer warriors to pray that we have speaking power. The Bible said we have binding and loosened power. I'm telling you, we can decree and we can speak and we can take authority over the intents and the entrapments of the enemy concerning our nation. But we have to have understanding so that we know how to pray. That's another teaching. But I just want to pray right now, as I said, Halloween, that uh, that uh, hellish high day for Satan's kingdom is coming up and they've already been celebrating it, already preparing sacrifices, holding people captive so that they can sacrifice them on demonic altars and release blood. The devil tries to copycat everything that the Lord does. Remember, he was in heaven with Father God before he got kicked out, but he has perverted everything. As I close, uh, I remember a friend of mine, she told the story, and she uh, stopped telling it after a while because the children of God would so come against her. But her mom and dad were really, really deep in Satanism and she told how at a uh, Halloween uh, hellish high day, they call it their holy high day I think, hellish high day that the mom and dad were required on an altar to enter into a in, in, enter into an intimate act and as a result of that she told what state it was in and the mountain area that it was in she and a brother were conceived and um, they named her uh, they, it was mockery to Mary and Joseph so uh, her name uh, I won't give her name she's going home to be with the Lord but her name started with M-A-R I'll just mention that and then then uh, the twin uh, started with the name uh, Joseph, the applicable's name Josephine. Well, that twin was later sacrificed in all that Satanism. She got out of all of that. She ran away, glory to God, was met by a Christian family and taken care of by a Christian family, got set free, pulled off all of those demonic teachings and enchantments, prayed before God. God cleansed her, healed her. She became a beautiful praise dancer before the Lord. But all of this stuff happened. The power of darkness is moving over the land. But we don't have to be entrapped by it. Father, I thank you for the teaching of the word. The, the title that you gave me tonight, Tore Up From The Floor. That's where many are. But Lord Jesus, I thank you 
that the gospel call is still released. You are bidding people to come. And I want to encourage you tonight to come unto him. Come with your baggage and all. Come to the king and surrender your life. Lord God, I thank you that you have all power in your hand. And the demons of witchcraft and sorcery, enchantments, all of that mess, the palm reading demons, all of that, everything has to bow to the name of Jesus. For God has highly exalted Jesus, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things underneath the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. I pray that you would join into that tonight. If you're operating in any of this mess, or bound up in this mess, have a generational curse of this mess, you need to bow in the presence of the Lord and repent. Just say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I have been participating in this. Lord, and I ask that you forgive me of my sin. And I ask you to come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Savior and be my Lord. He automatically adopts you in and begins to teach and to wash away the junk with the teaching of the Word of God. Get under good teaching. Get in a good Bible believing in church, a church where the power of the Holy Ghost is released from the altar to tear down all demonic strongholds. Glory to God. This is Minister Pat Holmes signing off from the secret place, and I want to end with the word shalom, which means peace. <laughs>